I will once again surrender to my humanity and pursue things that are boiling in the realities of my life and how they're affecting me. Um, part of the realities of my life, of course, are issues with clients. Often the work with clients is rather steady and quiet and goes on from time to time. Sometimes it gets very disruptive and suddenly there, there is a crisis or some horrible transformation is taking place in a client's life. And then that is an example of what I'm gonna be talking about right now, because I think we get pulled into how does this affect the work we've been doing? What is the work we need to do now? And uh, we search for uh, how we can be of help in the time of disruption and crisis. We've been used to being together with the client, most typically in the time of consistent onward progress. But being with somebody in a crisis that threatens everything is very different. So I'm a firm believer that uh, one of the ways to try and help myself get ready for a new challenge with the client is simply to surrender and <clears throat> do what I think my colleagues would talk about as enter my counter-transference about the case. Now, I have to back up because counter-transference is used ordinarily by those of us who do the kind of work I'm doing to refer to our emotional states uh, as we uh, encounter the client. What happens to us? What memories boil up in us? What fears boil up in us? What angers boil up in us? How do we manage our own emotional and memorial and fantasied reactions to what, what the client is interacting with us about? That is a totally mistaken use of the word counter-transference. I don't know how it got perverted and how we teach our graduate students and how we use the word, but I happen to be quite a purist and a historian. I feel very grateful for what was a very traditional uh, psychoanalytic education I had at the University of Michigan. And it's been, it's been appalling me to, to hear things, uh, training sessions, or uh, as I get out in the world at seminars of one sort or another, you have to be careful about your counter-transference. No. It's not your counter-transference you have to be careful about. And that's even a misuse of the word counter-transference. Freud was very specific about that. Transference happens in the therapy relationship. The therapist attempts to be as bland, as a blank a screen, as innocuous as the therapist possibly could, can. Because after a while, the client starts generating daydreams about the therapist, emotional reactions to the therapist, partly out of the frustration of the therapist not being real. And Freud said that is the transference of the patient to the client, to the therapist. And that is rich, rich fodder. Those things that are boiling up about the person of the therapist have great meaning in terms of understanding who the client is and what's important to the client. And the, the therapist then has his or her counter-transference, according to, to Freud. We are subjected to this coming from the client, and then things stir in us in response to what we're hearing from the client about how they imagine us, what they're daydreaming about with us, and we respond. It is only that narrow part of our stream of consciousness that Freud talks about when he mentions the, the therapist has to work with his or her counter-transference. It's he has to work or she has to work with his or her reactions to what kind of projections are being made on him or her by the client. It's not the sum total of the therapist's stream of consciousness or his or her pot of feelings or uh, big cachet of memories or whatever else the therapist can be going through from moment to moment in the therapy session or even outside of the therapy session, that should deserve an entirely different name. It's not, not the kind of transference, but we have perverted the whole thing. Uh, 
All right, I will take a left turn now. I believe I presented this in an episode, but I'm going to talk some more about the proper use of the word countertransference and give an example of how important my countertransference was to the work with a particular client many years ago. This was one of the most terrible and most frightening, maybe the most frightening client I've ever attempted to struggle with. Uh, I saw him about 25 years ago now. He was a man in his uh, middle 30s. He had been referred to me by one of my colleagues who shared space with me. She was working with the girlfriend and the girlfriend thought her boyfriend needed some help. Her boyfriend was having problems at work and the boyfriend was losing his temper periodically. And uh, she thought uh, he should be referred to somebody else in the suite. And my colleague picked me to start working with him. In the beginning, he didn't seem to be that remarkable. The problems at work seemed to be that he had serious differences uh, with the uh, supervisor he had. He was in the, what was then fairly glamorous and new IT section of a bank. And he was helping, the, one of his jobs was to help the bank to develop software to automate many of the duties of the bank that were now being done by tellers and clerks. And he was the cutting edge of the future and he had serious theoretical and practical differences from the uh, supervisor. And he, he retreated into an old life pattern. The life pattern was that uh, when he was sulky and angry about what he was expected to do, he would engage in avoidance behavior. So increasingly he was given deadlines to turn in drafts or proposals for certain pieces of software. In the beginning, he just procrastinated and waited till close to the end to turn them in. But after a while, he was simply missing those deadlines and acting like he didn't care. Felt almost like he didn't really give a damn whether the supervisor fired him or not. He wasn't making any real attempt to do the work that was being assigned to him. In addition, uh, he was uh, very annoyed and disappointed with his girlfriend, supposedly. I was hearing a lot about the relationship from his side. He, uh, he wanted her to be more, more forthcoming, more expressive of caring about him, uh, uh, less preoccupied with herself. Uh, there were a list of ways that she was failing him. And in the beginning, this sounded like a kind of borderline stuff that I would have to deal with. I was not alarmed or terribly concerned about what I was hearing. And I felt like I could go forward with the work. After about two months, uh, one day he came in and uh, he, he had been a subscriber to Psychology Today. And he had read an article in Psychology Today about the feminine liberation movement. And he brought the magazine and he threw it down on the couch where he was seated next to him. He said, I can't tell you what shit I read in this today. And I said, yes, you can. What, what, what got to you? You read something in psychology today and it's troublesome. He said, well, do you believe this shit? Let me quote some things to you and I want you to know what you think of it. And I was still trapped in old models of how I had to react to clients. So I said, well, I'd like to hear what you think about it. And he blew up. He suddenly exploded and he said, I don't give a fuck uh, about that. He said, I want to know what you saw in that. I come to see you because you're a psychologist and you have some knowledge supposedly that I'm paying you for. And I'm going to read you what I was bothered by in this article. And you tell me if you think that that's horseshit or not, like I do. And I said, well, no, please, why don't you just tell me what's on your mind about it? And then we'll proceed. We'll see where we are. He said, fuck you. And he stood up and he tur turned over my uh, coffee table, dumping everything that was on it on the floor. And then he stormed out of the office, reaching up on my bookshelf as he was going, taking handfuls of books and throwing them down on the floor and then going out my office door and, and slamming it so hard some of the plaster around the uh, metal thing that the door was attached to cracked. And I said, oh my God, 
what is this? What, what's happened? What's this crazy storm I just went through? And I assumed that was the last of it. He had uh, told me to go fuck myself and uh, I had lost a client. Wonder of wonders, later in the day, there was a voicemail for me from him. He said, I didn't get my full session today. He said, why don't I come back? And I said, okay. And uh, I made another appointment for him in a few days. And he came back. And I said, do you still want to talk about uh, what was in that article? I've saved the journal. It's sitting here next on the coffee table. And we can talk about it. And he said, I don't want you to do that psychology shit to me, though, anymore. We'll talk about it after you tell me what you think about it. And I decided to take a chance and not follow the traditional model of how to handle what he was doing. And I asked him if I told him what I thought, would he then tell me his thoughts about it? And he said, I don't know. I want to know what you uh, thought about that. And I reserve judgment on whether I'm ever going to tell you what I thought about it. And I said, okay, that seems to be important to you. So please read the passages. So we would read one passage and I would say, no, I don't exactly agree with that, I think. And I would give some amendment or he'd read something else. And I would say, I think that's pretty spot on. And uh, other passages, no, I, I, I would have a strong disagreement with that. So he went all through that and he said, one of the things that make me sick is there's so many articles in your journals, I read many of them, and in publications like this for the lay public, and you guys think you're a science, but you're actually just full of shit. You're just postul postulating things that have no meaning, and saying a bunch of gobbledygook, and you should be ashamed of yourself. Why don't you do research instead of working with clients and attempting to act like you know something about anything that would be good for us. So from then on, it got really dangerous. Uh, he would trap me. He would say, I want your opinion about, and if I didn't give him the opinion, he would blow up. If he heard my opinion now, he was blowing up. I can't work with anybody that's such an asshole like you. And he would storm out, trashing my office again on his way out. It got even worse. Uh, he began to threaten me. I think you're a danger not only to me, but to other people you see. I think you should die. He said, uh, I want to tell you I bought a gun the other day, and I have it at home. And one night, I'm going to wait until, uh, uh, oh, uh, by the way, because he screamed so often and slammed doors so often, I was seeing him at 7 o'clock at night in the, in the building, because even with all the soundproofing, uh, he, he was disrupting other people in the building with, with the way he sounded and acted. So I would wait for him at seven o'clock in the evening and I could see the driveway from the parking lot and I, I would start sweating and feeling uncomfortable when he was coming because he was threatening to kill me. It was, I was terrified every time I left. I wanted to make sure he drove away with his car, in his car before I'd go down. And, that, and then he upped the ante some more, he said, I don't think you should be the one that should die. I think you should suffer for the rest of your life. And therefore, you've left some magazines in the waiting room with your home address on it. I know where you live. I'm going to go to your house someday, and I'm going to ring the doorbell. And when your wife comes, I'm going to blow her brains out. You'll, you'll find her in a pool of blood and, and brains on the doorstep when you go home at the end of the day. And I said, is this true? Is he just wanting to torture me? I didn't know what to do. Should I, I, I was justified to stop seeing him because he was threatening me. Our ethical standards permit that, but I'm an idiot. And I said, who the hell is ever going to work with this guy? I'm here. He's trying to tell me about himself. I'm trying to work with him. I don't want to give up on him. I want, I want to continue to try to see this through to something better. And I have to eat my anxiety and terror and tame it somehow. It got worse and worse. So then he was going to commit suicide on the 405 with a suicide note in his pocket. He would uh, run into the, uh, try and climb over into the oncoming traffic and take out as many cars as he could on the way to uh, killing himself. And he would blame me. 
that it was my fault because I hadn't helped him and I hadn't succeeded in making his life bearable to him. Well, it got harder and harder. One of the things was I was carrying a secret for my wife during that period of time. I had heard his threats toward her. I had not said a word to her. She would have demanded that I get rid of him immediately in order to protect her. I was in a bind. I was trapped. What was I going to do? So I continued to bear in. And one day he, he was coming and I hit the wall. I didn't know what I could say to him. My heart was pounding. My armpits were sweating with fear. I didn't know what I was going to go through. So I hit upon uh, doing uh, something that's called now by the CBT therapist, radical self-disclosure. Uh, I don't know why or what prompted me to do that. Uh, I was also prompted to lock my office door, leave and go down some back stairs and not be there when he arrived. And then when he called to leave a message, what happened to leave a message from him? I'm not going to work with you anymore. Uh, that, that frightened me too, because I thought that was really going to trigger an attempt to kill me because I was abandoned. So I decided to bear in, stay there. He showed up and again, he was going to ask me about something and I knew he would be in the soup again. He wouldn't like what I said. He would start screaming at me and telling me how incompetent and stupid I was. And I said, I will answer what you're asking me because before I do, I'd like about five minutes of your time. And I'd like to be able to talk without an interruption I know you can get very heated and overwhelmed and want to interrupt and talk over me, but could you hold yourself together and give me five minutes to talk about something? I think it might turn out to be helpful to you. And he said, I'll try. So I started. I said, every time you come, I take you very seriously. I am frightened you're going to kill me or kill my wife, or commit suicide, any one, any one of those which would be a hideous outcome for my life. And I, I am frightened it's all real, even though I think maybe you just want me to suffer. If it's the latter, it's good. You are making me suffer. I am suffering a lot. You're very successful. I have a problem though. I have a commitment to trying to be helpful to you. And I'm not sure I know how to proceed to be helpful to you. Let me tell you what the problem is. I was a bad pick of therapist for you, not because I'm stupid or I haven't been trained properly. It's because of my own history. I do not do good when there's the possibility of violence. I had too much violence in my life when I was small. I grew up uh, in the 1930s in the United States. And I was an ethnic Jew whose parents had emigrated from Europe. And the United States was a cesspool of anti-Semitism in the 1930s. The American Nazi party was on the rise. It was unclear whether Roosevelt would be reelected or whether the party would, whether the country would swing from having allegiance to the, the, Brit, the Brits and French and the Russians of the world who were opposing Hitler and take up Hitler's cause and, and join with the, with the ranks of the countries who are aligning with Hitler and with the Japanese. That was very unclear. And in that time of terrible anti-Semitism, I was fucked by geography. My home was right across the street from St. Philomena's Cathedral. St. Philomena's was a worship place for Catholics, mainly working class uh, Western Pennsylvania Catholics. And there was a parochial school at St. Philomena's. And my public school was two blocks down the hill. And every day I would have to come up the hill, cross the street from St. Philomena's and go across the street to my house. And I was always getting there at about the time the, the Catholic kids were getting out of school and or milling around, playing, talking, horseshitting, whatever they were doing. And they would look at me and they would start laughing and calling me Jew boy. Then they would start calling me kike and Christ killer. And then they would start beating the shit out of me. They broke some ribs once. Uh, we had woods very close by and it was winter time. One day they took me and tied me up and carried me somewhere into the woods and left me to die in the woods all, all tied up. 
yelling Christ killer at me. Yeah. I felt small. I felt unable to defend myself. I was overwhelmed by superior numbers. And I was a physical coward to start with. I was never very brave about defending myself. And I, the last time I felt the way I, I'm going through with you is when that was happening to me as a kid. I feel like a small child overwhelmed by bullies and I'm unable to do anything. And he says, is that it? And I said, yes. He said, I don't know why you're telling me all that psychological shit, he said to me. And the question affected me. And I asked myself, why am I telling him all that psychological shit? I stopped for a second and I said to him, I apologize to you. I think I understand what's been happening between the two of us. Why you've been so angry and so murderous and so willing to kill me. I said, we have been doing like a psychodrama here. Although you have reversed roles. You are the bully, bully who's gonna make me feel miser miserable, torture me, make me frightened for my life. And I'm the poor helpless kid who's frightened all the time that I really am going to be killed. I'm not going to make it through. There's no end to this. And I'm helpless and hopeless. I said, I have a feeling you are recreating in some way with slightly different words what it felt like to be a child in your family. Although you've assigned me the role of being the child and having the child's experiences. And uh, you are the one who is the tormentor. I think it was probably your father, although I haven't heard enough about him yet to be sure. Could have been some other relative that did that to you. And I said, that's the best I can do to answer your question of uh, why did you say that to me? He said, that sounds like a bunch of horseshit psychology, he said to me. But he was not screaming. He was saying that in a kind of quiet, measured tone of voice. He said, I have something to talk to you about now. I said, okay. And we did one of his, uh, what do you think about this article? And I responded and he said, well, I disagree with you about so many things, but I don't think I wanna waste my time on that. Let me tell you what's going on with my girlfriend. And he switched the topics completely. From that day forward, he became more like an ordinary client uh, than he had been before. And we worked through a change of career for him and we worked through uh, the ending of his relationship with his girlfriend. And then, uh, see, I'm dealing with my own kind of transference. A memory comes to me of some of the most touching moments of my life with him. Uh, I saw the movie Field of Dreams. And uh, it moved me a lot because it's really about father hunger. That's what that movie is about not having had enough of father and not feeling as closely attached to father with the tossing of a baseball back and forth being the bonding experience that made for connection between father and son. And that was on my mind while I was listening to him one evening. And I said, did you play catch with your father? He said, no, I've never been good with the baseball. I started to, he never played baseball with me. And I started to play baseball on the playgrounds at school. And I got teased. I, I was told I throw like a girl and I, I stopped trying. I didn't have anything to do with baseball. I said, is your throw, throwing motion really bad? And he said, I think it is, I'm ashamed of it. And I said, would you allow me to do something? I'm gonna buy you a mitt and myself a mitt and two baseballs. And would you let me spend some time with you each session out in the alley behind here? And let me throw the ball. Let me see how you throw the ball. Let me see if I can correct the pitch and we'll toss the ball back and forth. And we did that. And I think that was a very, very meaningful experience for him that I was throwing him the ball and, and teaching him how to throw a baseball, not like a girl, even though he was 34 years old. Uh, I lost my connection with him because his father had a heart attack and they lived in New Jersey. He went back to, to his mother's home, who a woman he hated. He hated his father too, but in the last weeks of his father's life, he became quite kind and decent. He would call me from the hospital 
I was holding my father's hand today. I tried to read him a story. I tried to comfort him. He was acting like a son in grief instead of somebody who wanted that whole asshole to go fuck himself. He even had some kindness for his mother. And he didn't come back to California. His father died and he was the executor of the estate. And then he had to work with his sister, who was a, a nattering fool, and his mother, who was really a poisonous woman, he was in charge of the estate. He had to figure out what to do with the household, whether he should sell it, get an apartment for the one another, what was to become of his wife, his wife, his life. He better stick out around there. He wasn't easily to come back here. And uh, so he stayed in New Jersey. He got himself a position finally with a bank in New Jersey. And he would check in with me every once in a while. I referred him to a therapist I liked in New Jersey. But after a while, I didn't hear anything from him anymore. And I didn't try and stay in touch with him. I felt relieved he hadn't killed me. I, I was scared to try and re-amp re up the intensity of my relationship with him. That, everything could blow apart again and I would be back in the soup. I never fully got over my terror. So that's an example of how, how useful one's countertransference supposedly can be for understanding what is going on with a client and what is the drama that's being enacted in the consulting room. That's about the most vivid description of the power of transference and countertransference to move things in a different direction I can think of. So now I will let that preamble go and I will start into matters at present hand. I have at least three uh, situations in, in which my therapeutic relationship is doomed to change with the people who are relating to me. And I have to get ready to try and Think of something new, different, or embrace the changes that are going to descend on me. And so I'm going to do what I wish all my colleagues would do in moments like this, where some ongoing relationship is probably going to need to change. And that is, I am freely going to engage in an exploration, not of countertransference, because this is not of counter-transference, but I am going to free associate freely about what gets stirred up in me by the client or clients, the circumstances they're in, what kinds of thoughts go through me, what fears, what feeling states go through me, what possibilities do I see, what downsides do I see to those possibilities. I am going to share my internal stream of consciousness and debating with myself, with those of you who are listening to this today. Because I believe if we're courageous enough to do that and don't censor anything, but just simply let the thoughts come about how one reverberates to the prospects of change, then greater wisdom will arrive about how to swim with the change, master the change, and even steer the change. So I have to do some preambling again. Uh, case number one. This isn't even a case in a traditional sense. This is the lives of five people. At one time or another, I have been involved with all five of them in some particular way. They are the members of the family. And I've had a relationship with them now since I was 29 years old and I am now 91 years old. And uh, their, their father was the first, the father of the family was the first one who contacted me. I was 29 and he was 34. And I have been working intermittently with the entire family, one member of the family, one of the dyads in the family, another member of the family, in and out, back and forth, depending on uh, what the circumstances were and what the need of was. Uh, my wife and I have come to discover working with, with the family this way, radical family therapy. We, we are breaking some of the boundaries of what we're told to do. We're typically told that we need to pick a client, and then we need to pick how we're going to work with that client, and we need to stick to it. We either decide to see an individual, decide to see a family, 
decide to see a couple. But once we made that decision, we shouldn't contaminate it. We shouldn't get pulled away from seeing the couple to seeing one of the couple for a period of time and then going back to see the couple again. If we're seeing one person, we shouldn't sudden, suddenly agree we're going to start family therapy. We should stick to what we agreed to do. And it's dangerous if you break out of that mold and start becoming experimental and start having no rule at all about who you're going to see on which week, but turning it over to the family to let them show up with whoever needs to talk to me at any particular time. So I didn't do that. I didn't say to them, why don't you all decide any on any particular Thursday who wants to interact with me about what and I will be available. No, they came up with things they wanted. Sometimes the elder couple wanted parent, counsel parent counseling about what to do with one of their children and wanted to come talk to me for some sessions about that. Sometimes one of the uh, children wanted to talk about uh, what was painful about the family system or about individual therapy things that have nothing to do with family membership. And I would see that person and on and on and on and on, and on over all these intervening years. So now I'm up for readiness and a demand that I deal with really a very, very large uh, thing that's happening in this structure. Up until now, from the time I first met dad, there was an issue. Was the family going to survive in its current form back then? There were two young adults and one high school student uh, when I met dad. He was a professor of sociology at the uh, uh, the University of Michigan. He had been offered a very, very well endowed professorship at the uh, at UCLA. He was considered a comer in his field and a good bet to move towards uh, being a permanent member of the faculty very quickly. And his research was going to be very lustrous as far as the university was concerned. He so I told them his programmatic plans for what the future books were he was going to write and they were very impressed so off he comes mom had held uh, hung back in uh, ann arbor michigan uh, she didn't want to break up the uh, remaining child's uh, high school career she didn't want to take her in, in september to you to uh, westwood where the family knew anyone but she told her husband, Jack, that she would stay behind in Ann Arbor, at least until the end of the academic year. The boys would be allowed to decide whether they wanted to ever move to Southern California. And uh, she would decide whether she's coming herself in the fall. And the father was panic stricken. This was the first he heard that his wife was seriously dissatisfied with the nature of their relationship. And she was viewing uh, the move to Southern California as an option for her to elect to have a divorce instead of a move to Southern California. That was the only time the family structure as it existed seemed to be in serious trouble. And as a matter of fact, my first episode of work was to work with him about what were the difficulties between father and, and mother. Uh, what issues needed to be attended to, what was not working in their marriage, and on and on and on. I will only say at this point that I learned some about him. He had been referred to me by an analyst in uh, Ann Arbor, and he knew that I had had analytic training, and he thought I, he, would, I, he would be asked to lie on the couch and free associate, but I was already starting to move away from that model. So we had conversations about other things than his free associations. But I did learn something of his history that has remained critically important in working with him and understanding him. His mother had died in childbirth. He had lived, the infant had lived, but his mother had died. His father was immediately overwhelmed with grief and with fear and with stress because he had an older sister and he didn't know how he could juggle the older sister, the newborn baby, and the business he was trying to start. He had just opened a bakery and he was uh, trying to uh, 
and make all kinds of baked goods for the Jewish community around him. And at least daughter was in school. She was already in elementary school by this time. So she could come after school to the bakery. He could find a place for her to play. She could even help out a little. A, a, a little person who could put bread in the counter and the, in the display cases. He, he could make use of her and try and keep her busy, but he didn't know what he could do with an infant. So Jack got sent to his grandparents, who were old country Jews, fairly dour, not very expressive. And I don't believe they enjoyed having him. I think they felt trapped and that they had to do this. And they, they did what they would call the best they could. They fed him and made sure he had nutrition and made sure he was safe. But I don't think they played with him much, smiled at him much, stimulated him much, or treated him as anything of any value much. And his father was burned out, not very responsive too, when he would go visit the family home on the weekends. And uh, the, the, the father would turn him over to his uh, seven-year-old uh, sister to, to be entertained and to be played with uh, while he was there. So he got very, very, very poor parenting. And he grew up with an image of himself as a murderer. He was the one who had killed his mother. He saw tributes that people had written to his mother at her funeral. He saw how beloved she was. She had kept a, a journal of some kind. He saw what a free spirit he was and how lucky his father was to be with her. And he had taken his mother away from his father. He had killed his mother and he had made his uh, the sister an orphan and father never remarried either so that didn't help there was no curative step of mother who came on the scene so he went along uh, his whole way of being in the world was to try and be as invisible and inoffensive as possible he was not entitled to anything and he had a field of study he had to be magnificently significant in his field of study he had to prove to the world that it was okay if he stayed alive. And it was, oh, maybe it was not such a terrible thing if he was a mother murderer. And so over the course of his productive career, he produced 27 textbooks, many of which won awards in his field. He was much honored at the annual meetings of the American Sociological Society. Uh, <clears throat> and he had a very lustrous career. Nobody, he never told anybody. He made friends with some of his colleagues, but they didn't know about his inner life at all. They didn't know how depressed he was. They didn't know how self-loathing he was. And they certainly didn't know how every day of his life he felt like an, an imposter and that he was su successfully carrying out the imposter phenomenon. His career was gonna collapse. Eventually it would be discovered that it was an, an empty trick he was doing somehow and that everything would come crashing down. And one day his wife would leave him. She would get enough disgusted with him that uh, she would not want to put up with him anymore. And it wouldn't be surprising if she had a love affair. And uh, in that family, oh, I forgot to mention that every day he went into the classroom was a nightmare for him. He slaved over his notes. What was his lecture going to consist of? Why were his students not going to laugh at him? Why, why were they listening to him? And every one of them was like a visit to the guillotine. Was his head roll that day or not? Was that the day that the students would discover how empty and meaningless he was? And they would not put up with him. They would storm to the dean and tell the dean they shouldn't be teaching anything in this institution. Constantly full of that kind of history over the years I've known him. So, in some ways, he is magnificent. In the face of all of that, he persevered. Oh, he also had time to become a functionary in the American Socialist Party. He grew up with very liberal, liberal Jewish beliefs in the 1930s, and he proceeded to uh, carry them out. He was one of the people who organized support for uh, Bernie Sanders in the last, uh, in two elections back. Uh, he was very fond of Sanders. Sanders is a socialist too, and he wanted Sanders to win. He held many events at his house trying to raise money for 
Stan Sanders and trying to persuade his family to join in, trying to persuade his colleagues to join in. He's a man with a big social conscience. He is to devote himself to sparing the human race, and he's to devote himself to making the wisest and kindest sociologists as he could, and to be a leader in his field. So I'll fast forward a little bit. At the present time, he decided to give $10,000 uh, to uh, the uh, American Socialist Association. Uh, the, well, what the political parties called. He, he gave a 10,000 gift to him, gift to them, and they said the money is nice, but they would like to endow a scholarship in his name with that money. And they would like to train scholars who would understand the meaning and beauty of sociological perspectives. And scholars who are political activists who could develop active pro activist programs for how the country could be approached and people could be engaged in doing things that would be on a socialist agenda and engaging in activities to try and bring the fullness of socialism to flower in the United States. So he is now in charge of his own uh, foundation grant. And for the uh, first uh, go round, he got to pick who the entrants were and pick the panel that would decide who among them deserved the grant. So he, he lumbers on trying to overcome his own handicap, stumbling and falling and picking himself up, moving on and hating himself and crying in the privacy of his own bedroom. But he's been doing it for 91 years successfully. I'm pre associating, so I'm going somewhere else. Something else about him that I resonate to is strange courage. Another thing he learned growing up was he could feel more comfortable with strangers uh, and, and with classmates in school if he could make them laugh. So he decided to start reading as much Jewish humor as he could and to become adept at telling Jewish jokes. And he would take great pleasure if he could come up with a joke when he was in the bathroom with some boys and they would laugh uproariously. He, he, he felt that was a wonderful achievement and that he belonged. That was something that would allow him to feel bonded with the strangers he was with. And he would do that in his classroom too as a graduate professor. The culmination of that was for his 90th birthday, he went to uh, one of the clubs here in Santa Monica that allows people who want to do stand up. And he did a stand up shtick as his contribution to his 90th birthday. And most of it was full of the dark humor of telling the truth of his shadow. What a fraud he had been, how stupid he had been, how clumsy and frightened he is all the time. Examples of things he has screwed up, the simplest thing and making people laugh by being very transparent about his voice. He, he turned his very limitation into something that was a source of humor. So those are some things about my on and off connections with him. Oh, the next place I go is, he has been the most recent consumer of my time in the last few years. He retired when he was 85 and life got bad for him. The purpose of his life had gone away, and he didn't know what to do with himself, and he was very, very depressed. Not only was greater incapacity coming, he had, had to have two knee replacements. They were only partially successful. Uh, he is still in pain from them. He has trouble walking for any length of time or any distance. He had to surrender his uh, car because it was a stick shift, and it made him move his knees too much, and it was very painful to drive. So he had a, an old uh, classic Miata convertible that he loved. And he gave that to his grandson, who I'll talk about in a while. And it felt, it felt nice to him that at least somebody would get to continue to enjoy the Miata. And occasionally, the grandson takes him for a ride in his own Miata. <laughs> he loves doing that. Uh, but his increasing incapacity spread. Uh, he had uh, benign uh, prostate hyper hypertension uh, to a great degree. He could no longer urinate without having a tube put in him. And he now has to walk around with a, a superfusive tube and can't urinate through his penis anymore. And 
periodically the tube plugs up and causes him trouble and he has to go to the emergency room. So he is not a happy camper. He's not happy about his health. He also feels much less stable, like he could fall more easily. Uh, he, he feels uh, much less uh, uh, psychic or physical energy. He wakes up and he's tired and he wants to go back to sleep. He has breakfast and he wants to take a nap. He has lunch and he wants to take a nap. It isn't until about four o'clock in the afternoon that he feels alive and alert. He's also very depressed about the world. He used to be a huge consumer of news programs. And now everything he sees suggests that the world is in a retrogressive phase and socialist ideals are losing out everywhere. And fascism is now on the rise again. And he doesn't even want to listen to the news because it only makes him heart sick. All of the friends that he had, uh, even though they didn't know how painful it was to him to be their friend. He did have friends. He saw them periodically to have lunch with them. If they were fellow faculty members, he would talk to them on the phone. If they were at other institutions, people he had met, and he would try to be a good friend. All of them were dead by this time. He has only one left who lives up in Berkeley, a, a professor of social psychology. I knew him. I knew him when I was in graduate school. And he tries to give some good, kind, good comfort and encouragement to my client. He was instrumental in making something happen. He said to Jack one day when they were talking on the phone, you know, you were so aimless and so without anything. You have one good thing, you like watching old movies a lot. And that's nice, but uh, I think you can only do that so many hours a week before you get bored and satiated. But there was something I did when I used to live in Southern California. And I don't know if it's still going on, if you would be interested. She was, let's see, it's been about 20, 25 years since I was connected to her. She was probably about 50 back then. She'd be in her 70s if she's still alive. She's a woman who loved poetry. And she loved taking novices and trying to help them become poetry writers. She had a poetry workshop in Santa Monica. Uh, let me check and see if I can find her. Let me see if she's still running a poetry workshop. And let me see if she would allow you to join the poetry workshop. Would you even consider trying to write poetry? And he said, I can't write poetry. I wrote social science. That's, that's all I know how to write. I know how to do research and write social scientific studies. What are you asking me? Write poetry? I've never read a book of poetry in my life. And he said, well, you're used to stringing words together. I'm telling you, she works with anybody. She believes anybody can write meaningful poetry if they allow themselves to go with their internal flow. Would you at least go and meet her? She's willing to have you come. So over his skepticism and terrible objections, he did show up finally about eight months ago. And he did start sitting in the poetry workshop, and she was very non-demand. She said, you don't have to write me poems now. Forget about it. Here's how we work. Each week, I think of a topic, and I ask the other members of the group to write a poem on that topic. They have one, week, one hour, the first hour we're together, to generate the poem. For two hours then, we discuss everybody's poems. They read their poems aloud. We talk about our reactions to it, to that, what the poems make us think of. Can we see any ways the poems can be improved? Is the poem wretched and it should just, just go in the wastebasket? Or is there something else related to this poem that maybe the person could write? We have fun playing with each other's poems. So would you at least sit here and after a while, could you join the group? Could you start reacting to other people's poems? And he said he would try, he would come for a few visits and then see if there was anything after that that he could start saying that people started saying their poems. So he started critique other people's poems. And then one day he said, what is it you're gonna ask us to write a poem about today? And uh, she, she said, the shadows left by the trees. That's the topic she picked. And he said, oh, he said, I might be able to write about that. I like looking at the shadows that are left by the trees. So he wrote a poem about the meaningfulness of shadows left by trees. 
And he joined in then and his, he read his poem a while after the other people read there. And everybody liked his poem a lot. And the woman who ran the group said, that was quite a beautiful use of words. Uh, uh, I could feel the mood you get into when you look outside at the shadows of the trees are casting and how grateful you are to trees for existing. You did that beautifully. So he started to get more interested in going to the group. And after participating for several weeks, he started writing a book of poetry. And wonder of wonders, he not only wrote a book of poetry, he figured out how to get his book of poetry published. And it was published and it's available on Amazon and he's selling a few copies once in a while. And he, he has gone uh, to uh, senior citizen places uh, where they have uh, outside speakers come in. And often he's, re he's read his poems to, to fellow elderly people too. And he gets some nourishment out of that. Uh, but it's not been enough. Still, most, most of the days of his life is feeling terrible to him. He's distraught. Uh, he feels awful for being alive. He's guilt-ridden about what, quote, he's putting his wife through. And uh, he doesn't feel good about living. He, he said, there's no purpose to my life anymore. Poetry is not enough. Um, okay, I'll take the fork in the road that occurred to me. Something new has shown up. Uh, I don't have the exact name of the author, but this family, the little family, the couple, the elderly couple, is not without financial resources. He has a very nice set of uh, uh, royalties coming in from all those textbooks constantly. They're still in use a lot. And he has a wonderful pension from UCLA. And his wife came into an inheritance when her horrible mother died about 20 years ago. So she has some money that is part of their uh, holdings. And th they're very comfortable for the rest of their life. They, they have several million dollars, I'm sure. And they, they don't have to worry about indulging themselves in some ways running out of time. So I started to nag him and brought his wife into some conjoint sessions because she was bitterly protesting that he had become increasingly incapacitated. He couldn't run the errands for her anymore. He couldn't reach up into an upper cabinet and fetch anything if she needed something taken down for her anymore. She was very, very demanding and wanting to point out how her life had changed from the worse because of the processes of aging in him. And I started to talk to her, look, you have a choice. You can get increasingly overwhelmed and eventually have caretaker burnout, or you can spend some of the money you have and you could start bringing in kinds of external help into the house to take pressure off you, to cook meals sometimes, to run errands for you, whatever you wanted anybody to do, you can pay somebody to do that. And I suggested they get in touch with a Jewish family service and they hire a case manager who would come and be familiar with the challenges and stresses they're living through and make recommendations and even find resources for them. If they needed somebody to uh, take him to doctor's appointments, they would find somebody with a car who was used to driving elderly people to doctor's appointments and on and on. So it started to get a little bit better for her for a while uh, and, and much help was hired. Uh, in addition, I thought things were improving for him. Uh, there is a service called the Peacock, I think that the, uh, I, I'm not sure that's the right name, that the case manager suggested to Jack. That th this is a group this is a nonprofit that has a huge array of personnel and their job is to find meaningful things for particular clients to do. So if you wanted to sign up, there would be a fee to join. And then somebody would come who's an evaluator and would talk to you about your tastes, your interests, your rec the things you like to do recreationally, things you like to look at, the things you hate, and they would design a weekly program for you of places to go, events to have, 
lectures to listen to, things you might be interested in, new skills you might take at what community college. They would try and set up a supportive program for you to get you engaged with more things in the world or not. Are you willing to do that? And I, he said, should I do that? That sounds crazy to me. And I said, yes, what the fuck do you have to lose? You're going to risk some money. There's a membership fee for becoming eligible. And then any of the activities you go to or use somebody to accompany you to go, because you can't go on your own anymore, there will be fees at that. You'll have to pay for every one of these experiences. You have the money, for Christ's sake. You put it away because it was there for you to spend in your older years. And uh, so I convinced him finally, and I got a, an email from him that so-and-so, I forgot the guy's name, was coming on Wednesday, and he was going to talk to him, and he'll let me know how it turned out. Then I get another email the next day. This young man showed up. He looked like he was about 35 years of age. Uh, he had a guitar with him over his shoulder, and uh, he said, do you play the guitar? He said, yeah. He said, I I like going walking sometimes and playing the guitar. Sometimes I'm driving somebody somewhere and I have to wait and I'll try and write some songs or entertain myself. So yeah, I have a guitar with me. So he started interviewing Jack and Jack told him about writing poetry, told him about all his textbooks, he told him about his socialist interest uh, and so on, he told him that he would like to know more about art. His, his wife is very into, into going to museums and galleries now, but he doesn't understand any of it. And uh, he doesn't know about much of it. Maybe he'd like to do that. He isn't sure that he could walk around sufficiently inside a museum to enjoy being there. And uh, I, I forgot what else was on his list, but the guy was listening and taking notes. So he came back with a proposal for last week. The proposal was he would come on Monday. He would make sure they were able to attend. There were two galleries and the, they, they would be exploring the Los Angeles Art District downtown. That's become a hot topic and a hot thing in the contemporary culture. So he, he had uh, put on, on reservation that he and Jack could go to two different galleries that had two very interesting displays of contemporary art and he'd gotten commitments from the gallery owners since Jack might conceivably be interested in buying a piece of work to give, give a little lecture about why the gallery owner had chosen to exhibit the art that was in there and what was special about that art. He, he would get a, a short little lecture on art appreciation at both of the galleries. Then the two of them would go uh, out for lunch and Jack always liked German food and he had made reservations in the German restaurant downtown, so Jack, he and Jack could have a German lunch after the, uh, <laughs> the, the greeting, and then they would see what else they wanted to do, how tired Jack was. And Jack has one of those things that you can hold on to and wheel to steady yourself, but it converts to a wheelchair if you get tired. So he was perfectly willing to stay by Jack's side and make sure he got a chance to take in and to see and be present at everything that had been planned. So while after lunch, they decided they were going to go to uh, Griffith Park for a period of time. There was a place in Griffith Park that was by the, by the uh, merry-go-round. Jack wanted to sit there. He had been there at the merry-go-round with his kids when they were small, and he wanted to be, go visit the merry-go-round again. And they could just talk and get to know each other better. And so <laughs> they go there. The guy has a guitar on and he said to Jack, uh, do you have any of your poems with you? I said, no, I bring your poems. He said, do you know any by heart? He said, well, there are a few that I like, and I, I know them by heart. He said, would you do something for me? What do you want me to do? Please start reciting one of your poems. So he, Jack starts reciting one of his poems, and the guy takes his guitar, and he starts picking chords, and he st starts spinning melodies. And before they were done, he had written, he had turned the poem and the lyrics for a song he was creating. And the, the young man himself said, this is wonderful. I can get paid for doing this. I've, I've always had no trouble writing melodies, but I've had trouble with lyrics and you have wonderful lyrics. So maybe we could be a songwriting team. <laughs> have you ever considered doing that? 
So they actually wrote two songs during this period of time before Jack came back. And Jack was turned on. He, he thought the project, he's, he has 82 poems now, the project of trying to turn his 82 poems, each one into a song of some kind that maybe people would listen to, felt just delicious to him. So what was his reward? I'm almost having to stop. I knew this would be part one. Part two, well, before I get to part two, his reward was, his wife said to him, I have been trying, I've been using extra help, uh, but you are still too heavy a load. I cannot be responsible for you anymore. It's time for you to go to assisted living, she said. Uh, we're gonna find an assisted living place for you and uh, you're gonna stay there and I'm gonna stay in the apartment. I am the economy. I'm going to do what I've been wanting to do for the last five years. I am going to go on a road trip by myself. I'll go at my own pace wherever I want to go. And I want to stop in all the cities where there's great art and just take my time looking at whatever art I want to look at. And I don't have to worry about whether you're being taken care of. I don't have to worry about what's happening in the condo. We'll pay somebody to live in it, tend to it. I just want to worry about myself for as long as it takes me to get myself back and feel alive again. But you are having to go to an assisted living spot now. And Jack protested as best he could. He cried some. Uh, it was his worst nightmare coming true that at last his wife was going to abandon him. But he, he, he said, oh, yes, off on a side road. Something I observed over all the years that was causing pain in this family is that there was a huge and ugly triangle. Uh, the wife always continued to resent having put the family back together. She wasn't happy with her husband at all. It might have been better if she'd gotten a divorce at the time he moved to Southern California, but she tried to do, quote, the right thing. Jack could feel like she was irritated with him. She was frequently curt and critical. If he asked for a hug, for instance, he wanted to say, he asked her if when they got up in the morning, every morning, could she hug him and tell him that uh, uh, she, she loved him? And she told him with scorn and contempt, that's how needy you are. I'm not interested in responding to somebody as needy as that. And that's exactly what she doesn't do. He is a drain and he's needy. And so there is this wonderful triangle. Uh, Jack has turned to the daughter and the daughter has been his comfort object. He has complained to her endlessly about the disappointments he feels in his mother's capacity, in her mother's capacity to be warm with him, to be appreciative, to see him for who he is, to find good things about him. He's always hearing criticisms and put downs from her and he's, he's hungry for something else and he feels so grateful that his daughter doesn't treat him that way. And he started going to the movies with his daughter when, he was, when she was a teenager. And he started taking her out to lunches and he started taking her on shopping expeditions. So she is his, his female beloved. And that's made great trouble in the family. So there's been intermittent breakage between mother and daughter because this only contributed to great bitterness on the part of the mother towards the daughter that the daughter was being conned and sent into orbit uh, around her father, believing that mother was the cause of all the family pain and difficulty they were experiencing. And that was, and that was, un that was un unfair shortcomings that were making the trouble. And so I've been listening to these kinds of things on and off for all these years now. But at any rate, uh, Amy, who had been at some distance because of some fights with the mother in recent months, heard that there was a crisis going on. Mother explained she didn't have the time or patience to find a uh, place for her father. Uh, Amy did not want her father. She was still responsive to him, did not her, want her father to have to just go with the case manager and try and find some place. She brought herself and his grandchild and the two of them went shopping with him, looking at various places, finally picking a place, finally moving him in. The grandson was left as the token. 
he spent the first three days when he wasn't at work. He, and he was working from home a lot. So he was there a lot, spent the first three days with granddad and granddad's new surroundings, went to all the meals in that place with granddad. And before uh, he pulled back, he told his granddad he loved him and he would not abandon him and then, then left. Uh, Jack has been on his own resources. But if that isn't crisis enough, one day after Jack went to live in the board and care facility, mother had an episode, a physiological episode. It's not been diagnosed yet. It's either a transient ischemic attack. Uh, it might have been a, a small stroke, bigger than a TSA. It uh, might have been a, uh, a hemorrhage that's been undiagnosed yet. It may have been a heart attack or a blocked heart artery. Whatever it was, she passed out, fell to the floor, groaned and was unconscious for a few, for many minutes. The paramedics managed to get her alert again. She was confused, didn't know where she was, had trouble with speech, and they took her to the intensive care unit. And so I thought about the last thing I was gonna hear was Amy got in touch with me. She was checking in with me, telling me the progress she was making on placing her father and then the sudden disruption of mother's life and some updates, mother is moving out of intensive care. She's going to the ordinary hospital room. And then two days ago, mother is now going to be discharged from the hospital. She's still weak. They don't know what it is. She may have to actually go to board and care too. They don't know if she's capable of making it on her own. They're gonna allow her a trial and uh, there'll be a nurse there for in residence for some period of time. And uh, that's uh, what happened. She collapsed with an uncertain future. And my last piece of work is Jack finally called me and he tried to brief me on what had been happening. I told him I knew. I told him as best I could. He said, are we still on for therapy on Tuesday? I said, well, we are if you want to be. He said, yeah, I need to talk to you. I don't know where to go or what to do. And so there I am. I am now doing therapy with him in a board and care facility with an uncertain relationship with his wife. An old the last comment, the last thing in the email that came from the daughter was, I have had it. I've devoted every ounce of energy for six days already to what's going on here. And I can't stand it anymore. This is it. I am done with those people. I'm not going to have anything further to do with them. So that's another piece of my mosaic. Okay, I'm done for today. You hearing my free associations about what I'm living through and some contiguous pieces of what I've already experienced. I have lots more of what I'm living through, what it means to me, what I'm thinking about, and contiguous pieces you haven't heard about from the other members of the family, from the wife, from the daughter, and from the two sons. Uh, I, have a I have a question and two comments. Is that if that's okay, okay. Arthur? Sure. The, the, the one question goes back to the first case in terms of... Um, you know, you're, uh, uh, the, if you were feeling threatened and, and in danger and uh, the uh, client was, uh, you know, kind of like going to kind of like come to your home, that sort of thing. I, uh, how come you didn't report him or, or basically <laughs> close up shop or, or, you know, call the police, that sort of thing. So I'm just kind but of Harry curious. Was, as he, he was going to do Harry Carey anyhow. That's what it sounded like. And I was convinced that would have triggered him into either just committing suicide himself or trying to take me out and die too. I felt very blackmailed by his threats. Right, but you were committed to saving him, I think. Is that right? Not right? Oh, too. Yeah, I was not going to fail. This is, yeah. this is who he was. Yeah. The, the other... I wanted to work with that. Yeah. The other comment is, uh, I think that the greatest intervention that, that I've heard, um, and you, you kind of like, certainly kind of like uh, provided a, a number of them, uh, extraordinary interventions and, and uh, uh, weird ones, but playing catch with them was a tremendous intervention. 
and and it reminds me counters my uh, counter transference in terms of that uh, every night after dinner I would play catch in the backyard with my father. Yeah, lucky. The, man. Yeah, I would have done that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. The, from you? Huh? Anything from you? Well, I was just, uh, I was wondering, um, I wanted to give you a line when someone threatens to kill you next time. Because uh, I've had that happen once, and uh, I, I just told the guy to take a number and get in line. <laughs> <laughs> and then I told him better than you have tried. <laughs> just a, a, also an interesting aside, uh, Arthur, um, at the University of Michigan, when I was an undergraduate, I took a sociology course by, by a, a beloved professor, and his, his um, first name was Jack. So I don't know if it's the same one, but, you know, could <laughs> may be. Have been. Yeah. May have been. Well, what year was that? No, uh, too young. He, he was gone out of there, uh, let's see, in 1962 or three. No, no, it was after that, well after that, 10, 12, well, 15 years after, yeah. No. Okay. Anything else? No. I will continue my morbid preoccupation with this entire family and with the question of what am I going to do with Jack when I see him on Tuesday? I will at least have done something with Jack on Tuesday. <laughs> and I'll continue this. Uh, now, just some final comments and maybe to try and engage the family again at this moment somehow. That may be what I need to do, but I have to explore all the things I'm going through before I make a decision or a choice. Bye. Okay, right. have a good weekend. You too. Yeah, bye-bye.